Okay, everyone, I'm going to get started here. Now it is 3.15, which is when this actually starts. Uh, I'm Greg Smith. I work for uh, Crunchy Data Solutions. Uh, talk here today, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Postgres storage latency and throughput and how those two things relate to one another, how you can tune for the two of them at once because they do interact. Um, the first thing that I want to make sure I define for you in this context is throughput. Um, throughput is how much work you get accomplished at some task. Uh, normally you measure throughput in some sort of operations per second context. Uh, I'm going to use PG Bench for all the examples here. It's a little benchmarking tool that comes with Postgres. Uh, in, in PG Bench, the, the specific tests that it runs are referred to as transactions, because uh, most of them are wrapped in a little transaction block. And so it shows you transactions per second for whatever it is you ask it to run. Uh, so when we're talking about throughput here, we, we basically mean how many transactions per second do we get, or uh, how many operations per second do we get on a disk thing. Um, the, the reason why this is interesting to talk about now uh, in the context of Postgres 9.4 coming out, earlier versions of PG Bench and Postgres, the way PG Bench worked is it always ran as fast as it could. You start some number of clients up and it just, as it finishes a transaction, it immediately tries to do another. So this, uh, this is interesting for stress testing your hardware and it's useful measurement of uh, a type of burst speed for how fast the hardware can go under maximum load. Uh, but it's not really realistic or, or like anyone's real world workload all of the time. You may have periods like this, but the run like this constantly is, is not really been a good representation of, of the real world for people. So, uh, I'll start by showing a little bit about how PG Bench has worked and what you might be used to seeing if you played with it already. Uh, for these examples, I'm, I'm picking a, a basic middle of the road server for hardware nowadays, 24 cores, 64 gigabytes of RAM, and just uh, to keep things simple, a, sim a single standard 7200 7, RPM drive. Uh, post Postgres's PG Bench asks for a scale that determines how big the database is. All these examples are using a scale of 100, gives you roughly a 1.5 gigabyte database. So all of this fits easily in RAM, uh, but is interesting anyway. Um, the, the basic settings for the database to just get normal performance and utilize as much RAM. The, the buffers that are dedicated to the database, the shared buffers, I'm setting that to eight gigabytes. So again, more than fits everything I'm gonna do to the database in RAM. Uh, and checkpoint segments, I'll talk about a little bit more and we'll, we'll actually see why it's an interesting thing to work on. Um, and the, the graphs that you're seeing are all coming out of uh, a small PG Bench toolkit that I've released for a while now. It's called PG Bench Tools. Just helps run lots of PG Bench tests and get graphs of things like latency and whatnot, uh, which, are, which are really important in this context. So, this is what PG Bench looked like when you ran it uh, in earlier versions of Postgres. Uh, the idea is you give it some number of clients, you give it some number of threads, which uh, the threads are actually how many PG Bench processes are driving those clients. Uh, we give it a duration. All of these tests are running for 10 minutes, uh, which is enough time to kind of see the database go through at least one full cycle of the activity it does. <laughs> And at the bottom of this, the number that most people start staring at is this TPS number. So here for this example, again, this is running flat out as fast as the database can go. It's, it's getting just over 1,700 transactions per second is the throughput on this test. Um, what I did is I took this and I ran it on three different drives to give a measure of what the throughput looks like as a starting point for the discussion. Uh, 
So this, the blue line at the bottom here, that's the single 7200 RPM drive. The one that's above that, a good bit faster, I've added a piece of hardware called a battery-backed write cache, which I abbreviate BBWC in all of this. Um, that's something that when you write something to disk and say, you know, I need this flush to durable disk, it will save that in memory in a way that it won't get lost if you lose power. And this actually accelerates a lot of writing operations in the database. And as you can see here, it easily makes some operations more than twice as fast in this context. Um, then our final data point, the thing at the top, that's an Intel uh, data center series drive, their DCS 3700. So uh, SSD, sometimes you see crazy claims for them. This, this, I think, is what I'm used to seeing, which is uh, it's easily five to ten times faster than a regular hard drive. You know, but it's not, it's not like unbelievably faster. And the gap from a battery-backed write cache to it is, is not even necessarily huge, uh, especially if you only have a small concurrency. So this is, again, this is throughput, transactions per second. How fast can we get work done on PG Bench's simple transactions? Uh, it does running as fast as it can. So this, this is interesting, and it's kind of useful data, but uh, I don't really think all that many people care about maximum throughput when you're running transactions all the time. <laughs> A lot more people ask me questions about latency. And the problem with this is testing this way and optimizing for this, it doesn't really tell you anything interesting about latency. Now, latency, as I'm using it here, the idea is that's how long does it take any client to get a response back from the server when it asks for something to get done. Now, you, when you see the transactions per second number that, that comes out of this, you can turn that into an average latency just by inverting it from transactions per second into seconds per, per transaction. I do that and I rescale this here just to get it in milliseconds, which is normally what makes sense for latency numbers. So if you have 1,000 transactions per second, that's one millisecond per transaction as an average. The thing is, though, average latency is interesting, and it's a, it's a single number you can compute. <laughs> But again, most people don't really care about average latency. They want to know about worst case latency instead. And that's where things get a lot more interesting. Um, so if I, if I take this same sort of PG bench test that I just showed the results from, and I run it, uh, that comes back at uh, 1339 transactions per second. That's an average latency of, of 3 quarters of a millisecond. But if you actually graph the latency on that, you'll find there are transactions that take over 3.8 seconds mixed in with that. So this is why you can't just take a number out of PG Bench and look at it and do anything with that TPS number on its own. Uh, when you start looking at the latency, you discover that's actually a much more complicated and difficult thing to get a picture of. This is what it throughput looks like if you actually graph it every second instead. And it should be pretty obvious what the problem is here. OK, this was averaging to 1,300 transactions per second. But that's not a steady 1,300 <laughs> transactions per second. That's actually sections of alternating between this really high speed writing where we're getting uh, sometimes over 2,000 transactions per second with these just complete dead periods. Uh, unfortunately, my graph got a little bit botched here, but uh, each, of these, each of these major grid divisions here running along there is, is uh, uh, a minute worth of test time. So when, when you see something like this, this big thing down there, that is a significant chunk of a minute where it's stuck with like barely making progress through that whole thing. So you might wonder, why does this happen? Well, when you run Postgres, one of the things that it has to do is worry about things that are in memory ultimately need to get to disk eventually. But you don't necessarily want to write those things every single time someone updates them. 
So we have this write ahead log mechanism that keeps it so this stuff will be safe if you crash. So we write stuff to there and then later we write it out to the main disks. The process that worries about making sure that all of those things are written to disk safely is this process called a checkpoint. So a checkpoint in the database goes through the, the memory that you've assigned to it, which in this setup that I'm describing was eight gigabytes, and it's gonna scan through all eight gigabytes, and anything that has been modified since the previous checkpoint gets written out, and then when that's finished, it can say, okay, everything up to this point in time is now written on disk. So when you see the cycles like this come out of a throughput graph like this, uh, this is the classic look of a system that has problems with checkpoints in the database. So when you're seeing it run really fast at the beginning, this is the time when it is not actually doing any checkpoint work. It is just buffering stuff in memory and it just lets it pile up and keep going and it's not worrying about it yet. So the, the big drops that are showing up, uh, the first of them is like right when you see this big drop there, that's basically when it starts writing out. So throughput drops immediately there. And then the big drop is there's, there's two phases to checkpoints in the database. First, it writes everything out to the operating system cache. Then it steps back and says, okay, now I need this to really get flushed to disk. And the flushing to disk part, which is what it calls the sync phase, this is the part that really hammers the hard drives. And when this gets going on, uh, performance tends to plunge. Bruce? Which storage system is this on? This one is coming from just the basic single hard drive. Um, so this is, if, if you're wondering how is it that this system ended up with things like a 3.8 second wait for a transaction at some point, you know, that's part of the mess that's in this slow period. And so this turns that around. This is, this is basically the same graph as what I just showed you, except inverted, rather than showing transactions per second, we're showing the latency for every individual transaction. If you stare at it long enough, you can realize those are you know, the inverse of one another. And these, you know, these graphs are basically graphing the same thing. It's just the a latency view is, is what I think more people are interested in from like an application perspective because how long uh, an individual client is gonna wait is more usefully measured by most people in the form of latency. So we see right here where the problem was. Right, right up here at the top, that guy right there, there is our 3,800 uh, millisecond latency guy. And uh, this is showing the same sort of flow. These periods here, it's just writing in the operating system cache and then it starts flushing that stuff to disk, latency goes up, and then you can normally tell when this process of syncing stuff is finished because the latency drops again. So just guessing right here is probably when the checkpoint finished. And you can turn on logging of checkpoints and double check and see whether that's the case. And this is partly why people tend to make recommendations like, well, if you start turning on logging of things like slow queries in your database, it's a, it's a good idea to turn on logging of checkpoints. So the, the way you would work that is if you got a big latency spike, you know, like one of these periods up in here, you could go back and say, okay, well, was there a checkpoint happening during that time period? And if that happens consistently, it's pretty good evidence that these, these checkpoint spikes are, are your problem. So it's uh, the basics of, of checkpoints. It's a, it's a big topic, and I'll, I'll get into some of the more interesting parts relative to today's topic. Um, so here's a different view on this. What I'm doing here, again, this is the same test again. We're just seeing a different perspective on it. This is on a Linux system. Uh, most operating systems expose this in some way. In Linux, data that you have written to the operating system that it has not written to disk yet is referred to as dirty data. 
Uh, there's a system view. Uh, I probably should have put it in here. It's called uh, slash proc slash meminfo. It will show you this. Uh, and one of, the, one of the tools in the PG Bench tools is a little collector that just wanders off and grabs that thing every second, saves it to disk, and then generates a graph like this at the end. So this is, this is showing uh, a different view on, on this same problem we've been talking about, which is when, when we're having these periods before a checkpoint has happened, uh, Postgres basically isn't writing anything to the operating system at the beginning because all of the writes it's doing fit in its own cache. So it doesn't need to put them to disk. It just keeps overwriting the copies in RAM. So when, when we see this start to pick up, that's when the checkpoint started. It's now aggressively writing memory uh, in shared buffers to Linux's operating system cache. This goes on for a good number of seconds. We spread this out over time. And I'll, I'll get back to that concept a bit. So the, the high water mark that, that is this point up here, uh, if you look at that, this is in kilobytes over here on the left. So we are almost hitting a, a, a gigabyte worth of dirty memory on this thing. So basically, at the point when the checkpoint is over, we've got a 1.5 gigabyte database, and an entire gigabyte of it has been updated by PG Bench, and it dumps the whole thing out as part of the checkpoint. And then once the whole thing is there, it switches over to these F sync calls to get it forced to disk. Bruce? Well, this test right here, the checkpoints are showing up uh, one, two, like two and a half minutes apart, which is basically the, it, it's above the point where it would warn you about it by default, but you could tune it to do that way. Um, so, so what we're seeing here is basically one, two, three, and the beginning of a fourth checkpoint are all happening during this 10 minute test run. So we're seeing one roughly every two and a half minutes. And this kind of flow where you've got a system and it just runs at top speed for a while and it just grinds to a halt and everything shifts from the database over into Linux, this is a pretty common sort of thing. And, and this is how it works. And I think it shouldn't be a surprise to you when I say that there's over, a, there's, there's over 900 megabytes of I.O that it is writing to Linux and then saying, now take that 900 gigabytes and flush it out to disk, it shouldn't really be a surprise if you're familiar with disks that this might take several seconds before that all finishes. So this has been basically what PG Bench lets you do. PG Bench lets you take a system, just completely fill up all the RAM with dirty data, and, and eventually, when it's been running for long enough that, that, that one of these checkpoints has to happen, it will just dump it out fairly quickly to the operating system. And then the operating system just chokes on it for a while while it waits for all this to, to play out. Um, so this is classic checkpointing problems. And this has been visible to some extent. I don't know that a lot of people have ever graphed this dirty memory bit over time. But this makes it really obvious where the stuff is getting stuck at. If we say, OK, what's happening during the slow periods? If I, go, if I go back to here, clearly those slow periods up at the top are right after it's dumped uh, 900 megabytes worth of stuff into the right cache. Well, is it, is it uh, I mean, I'm, I'm coming from a local background, thinking sure. about the local way interface. Yeah. There's, there's two interfaces to get at this data right now in Postgres. Neither of them are great, but they are available. One is, I mentioned there is a, a log checkpoint parameter that when you set that to on, you will get a text format note 
saying that the checkpoint started and then another one saying it finished and it gives some timing information and after you get some practice reading those you can sometimes spot the slow ones just from what appears in the timing info. Um, and the other thing is there's a system view that's more like the Oracle weight interface. It's not exactly like that. We're, we're moving towards a, a weight style interface. Um, the system view is named uh, PG stat BG writer, which is short for background writer. Whenever a checkpoint finishes, it updates some statistics in there. So you can, if you graph that over time, you can tell where the checkpoints happen because the spots where it jumps up are when it finished a checkpoint. So that's. This has latency from checkpoint, but obviously it is. It's it's just. It's not, it's not really telling you anything about latency. It's just showing you that a checkpoint finished. Unfortunately, you still have the job in Postgres of lining this up with other events to kind of see how they all connect. So I wish I had a better answer. And we're working on a better answer. It's just not ready yet. All right. So this has been where we've been at for a while now. And this just takes these graphs and overlays them again. OK, pretty clear. The, the weights are coming from the, the end of the checkpoints. It's all spiking up. Um, and basically, I'm not even going to tell you what to do about this in particular. What we're going to talk about is the fact that this is not even really appropriate, though, because we're only seeing this get so bad because we are running this thing flat out as fast as it'll go all the time. And that's not really realistic. Uh, if you do that, all of your caches will fill and then stay filled until each checkpoint is over. Uh, the hardware is never going to completely catch up with everything. It's always going to have stuff there. And here's, the, here's one of the really important points here. If you take this workload and you tune your system, you do things like adjust the checkpoint parameters, you do all this other stuff, if you optimize for this case, you are only optimizing for throughput, for getting lots of transactions per second processed. It is really easy, in fact, likely, that if you do that, you will actually make latency worse, because latency and throughput are connected to one another. And I will show you how that works here in a second. So, Tuning for the traditional PG bench case is not necessarily productive. And if you're doing that because you want latency to get better, step back because you can easily make latency worse. All you're doing if you tune for that is tuning for maximum throughput instead, not the latency of any individual thing. So we, uh, this is sort of amplifying this behavior a bit. There's a, there's a parameter in the database that people haven't had really good visibility into. The concept is, rather than writing all of the data out at once, we, we can spread the checkpoint out over a period of time. And the parameter for this thing is called checkpoint completion target. It's specified as a percent, and it's a percent of the total time the system spends in between checkpoints. So the idea is, the graphs that I've been showing you included the database trying to spread the I.O. out over a bit. If you're skeptical that that really helps, what we're doing here is just turning it off altogether. And if you turn it off altogether, we get this really sharp discontinuity where it just dumps all the data out even faster than it did before and then goes as fast as it can towards getting it all synced out to disk. And um, what's interesting about this, and this, this will happen all the time, and it's, it's one of the key points I want to communicate here, doing that, you look at this graph on the, on the right, and I mean, that thing is just a, that's a transactions per second, that thing's just a wreck, right? Like, if, you're, if your system performed like that, you know, you'd be out the door. But the interesting part is the throughput of that PG bench run, its transactions per second number is faster than the one that I showed you before. So that's actually more than 1,300. I think it was about 15, 1,600 transactions per second. And this is the weird thing that is important to realize. If you take your data and you write it 
in one giant burst and you combine a lot of things into that operation, the more stuff you cram into I.O., the more efficient it gets and the throughput goes up. So even though this thing is just sitting sucking wind, when it is running, it is running so much more efficiently that the gains in transactions from that outweigh how long it spends doing nothing. So this is, this is what I was just warning about. If you took your system and all you looked at was transaction rate, throughput number, and you tune the system like this one I'm showing on this slide, if all you looked at was transactions per second, it would say you just made the system better. But this is clearly not better than what we had before. Chris? Uh, this has some characteristics of a bulk data load, but typically a bulk data load will not be running, you know, 24 processes at once and kind of filling everything up like this. You, you can get a parallel bulk data load that will look like this, but I mean, you, you really got to work your data loader to, to beat on it as hard as PG Bench is. All right, so I think I've beat on this. The, the, main, the main point here, so the, the first lesson is optimizing for throughput will do bad things to your latency, and you need to really be aware of which are you doing. So what's new? Well, in Postgres 9.4, there was a feature submitted that the minute I saw it, I jumped right on it, something I've been waiting for for a while. It lets you limit how much work PG Bench does during any period of time. Um, so we, we refer to it as a rate limit, sometimes called a throttle when, when it was originally submitted. The idea is, in this example, I'm running 16 clients for 30 seconds, and I'm limiting it to 50 transactions per second. That's it. If, if it's, it kind of, it creates a schedule to kind of like thump something out every 50, 50 times a second, and if it's not time yet, it just sleeps and waits, and all the clients do this in a way that on average works out like that. So um, these examples I've switched over a bit. These, these battery-backed write caches I was talking about before, uh, I'm, I'm adding one now to the drive, and this is one that's capable of holding 256 megabytes. And a lot of people think, well, if I put that in there, as long as the checkpoints are writing less than, I don't know, maybe half that might be used for writes. Let's say it's half reads, half writes. OK. So theoretically, I can absorb 128 megabytes of writes without overloading this, right? Well, it doesn't really work out like that um, in the real world, unfortunately. So let's see how it does work out. Um, Checkpoint spreading, I, it's a long topic. I wish I could go on, well, actually, I, I may be the only one who wishes I could go on even more about it. Um, but uh, by default, we do a 50% spread, and that's probably fine. It's really, it's not a big deal to, to get crazy about that. The more important stuff is we have these two parameters, checkpoint segments and uh, checkpoint timeout. They determine how often checkpoints happen and those are, the, those are the important things. The normal good practice is increase checkpoint segments until you're getting a checkpoint that's based on the timeout. And to give you an idea, the default timeout is five minutes. So increase checkpoint segments until you get a checkpoint every five minutes. That's a decent way to start on your checkpoint timing. Um, if you if you get to that point, um, there's other things that you might think would help, like sometimes people will go, well, my latency is bad, so let me reduce the size of some of the caches. Or they'll do things like, oh, well, this Linux scheduler thing, I have this choice of CFQ or deadline or no op, and maybe no op sounds more like it's right into my rate controller, and maybe uh, deadline sounds better for latency purposes, but it turns out all of this stuff is like way down the chain of things that matter. Uh, what really matters is how big the caches are and how stuff things move between them and how those things are related to each other. 
So here's, uh, here's an example. So this, this thing I've now moved to the 50 transactions a second. That's all I'm pushing through this now. It's so otherwise the same sort of test I was doing before. So what you can see, what's happened here is now with only 50 transactions a second coming through, uh, the amount of, of memory that Linux is getting dirty is usually not even registering here. Now instead of peaking at 900 gigabytes, we're only seeing, uh, or 900 megabytes, we're only peaking at 30 megabytes here. Okay, so this shows that limiting the rate does what you'd expect. It's now generating so much less stuff that for the most part, the disks are writing it out as fast as it comes in. They're keeping up now. So this is why this is a more useful thing than what we had in earlier PG benches. This is now showing us something that the disks can keep up with. So if we can see what the disks can keep up with, and then we make a change, and now the disks can't keep up with it, we've now learned something useful about the capacity of the system, more useful probably than what its maximum throughput is with completely overloaded stuff. Um, so this is, this is why I think it's interesting uh, to use this. I'm starting to do most of my latency tests with uh, basically the smallest uh, transaction per second target that I can pull off that doesn't seem completely trivial and I'm trying to work through and see well how low can I get latency with that almost trivial seeming workload. Um, there's a numeric thing here though, two, two interesting facts about these, this paragraph. The first is these spikes are only getting to uh, just over 30 megabytes. But if we look at the latency graph on the right, it's still getting hung up for over two and a half seconds. So the first thing to realize here is that the fact that the battery backed write cache is capable of holding the 20 megabytes worth of writes, that doesn't mean it's going to absorb them on the checkpoint writes. Because by the time you get to the checkpoint, you have already been writing to that system for minutes worth of time. And so by the time you get to where a checkpoint happens, it's often the case that like the write caches on your disk array, or your RAID controller, those things tend to be filled before you even get to starting a checkpoint. So that's why they don't save you. You can't just look at that number and compare it to the size of the cache on your controller and say, oh, it'll fit or not fit. You have to ask, how filled was it before you got there? And unfortunately, no one really has good visibility in, into that even that I know of. Uh, I wish when I got RAID cards, there was a nice easy interface where I could say how much of your cache is currently being used for write data. You know, it's, it's not, it's generally a black box. We throw writes into it. We don't really see what happens to them. Um, so that's, that's an interesting thing. And then the other thing is just to step back and go, whoa, I am, I'm only writing 50 transactions per second, but I am, this whole system is backing up for two and a half seconds. Okay. <laughs> Part of why that's happening, though, is because I specifically turned off checkpoint spreading by tweaking this checkpoint completion target. So this is basically, this is to demonstrate to you that checkpoint spreading does something useful. Uh, even with a battery backed write cache, all this other stuff, we can still get hung up for, for two and a half seconds here on this simple example. Um, wow, I forgot uh, how I did that. Um, yeah, let me try this again. Um, but it's clearly still important that we worry about this to some extent because it still gets stuck. So let me, let me go through some discussions of the things that uh, you have to worry about here. So one thing you might think for how do we get rid of this two and a half second gap is, well, maybe we could change how big the write cache is. You know, the Linux write cache is, there's parameters with names like dirty background ratio. A lot of people get to this point and say, oh, let me just shrink that, it'll be fine. That doesn't actually work out. I'll show you what happens in a sec. Um, the problem is, 
if you decrease the size of a cache, it makes it less efficient. The bigger your cache is, the, the more room it has to make things more efficient. So when you reduce the size of a cache, that doesn't necessarily make things faster because small caches also have slower throughput. So there's a trade-off here. You might think, I use a small cache, I, get, I have less stuff building up, I'll get lower latency, but if you actually hurt throughput in the process, it can end up being slower than where you started at. Um, why is this? There's actually a couple of mechanisms. This is a whole other topic altogether, but just to give a, a brief flavor of them, when you do I.O. in big chunks, it does this thing called elevator sorting, where it tries to take things that are on the same area disk and put them all together. Uh, it does this thing called write combining, like two things that are writing to adjacent chunks. It'll just do them together as one operation. Uh, also, if you write something and then you, re you write it again a minute later, or if you write something and then you go read it again, it doesn't really have to read it, just grabs it from the cache again. Basically, all of these things, the bigger your cache is, I, I sometimes call this a caching horizon. The idea is how far can the cache see? How much visibility does it have into what's coming up? As that number goes up, it actually makes the throughput go up as well. So this is really important. If you try to defeat this by saying, well, let's get less dirty memory in the system to begin with, it doesn't really work because efficiency drops, you get less of all these things, and now when you get a backlog, you can't get through it anymore. Um, similarly, some people think, well, why doesn't Postgres just use direct I.O.? And you know, it schedules all the writes and goes from there. The thing is, the model that we have for how Postgres does writes at this point expects that this operating system caching is going to be there, and if you take it out of the system, there are all kinds of things that just become absolutely terrible. And when I say absolutely terrible, I mean, like I'm showing you things where I'm seeing two, three, four seconds worth of latency. Try switching a Postgres system that's heavy on writes over to direct I.O., and you'll see that number jump to like 40, 50, 60 seconds instead. You get stuck for a full minute trying to write out stuff if you don't get at least a little help from the operating system with it. So, um, so what I wanted to do to, to, to kind of give a, a reasonable intro to what this feels like in the real world for you is I wanted to give some examples of how these storage latencies work out. So the idea is I, I picked a low transaction rate, this 50 transactions a second. I small number or medium number of clients in memory database and what I'm looking at now is how fast information is moving through this whole system. Yep? Uh, is that 50 transactions per second for each of the clients? It's total across all the clients. Okay. Um, I want to see how fast things move through this whole mess. Uh, so here's my first example, the single disk. Uh, even though uh, I've, I've got this very small amount of work I'm doing, uh, no matter how I shuffle things, I still get periods where there's, there's uh, roughly a second worth of, of delay on there. And normally, uh, single disks have roughly 10 milliseconds worth of I.O. is a worst case. Um, so, so what this is saying is it's very easy, even on this kind of simple workload, uh, to get roughly 100 of those in the queue that you get stuck waiting for in a worst case scenario. So if you're doing capacity planning for stuff and you want to, you know, some people are used to working in like IOs per second and stuff like that. I like to work now in terms of what's the latency target versus what we're getting. And you know, seeing occasional spikes as high as 100 milliseconds is not unusual. It's actually hard to do much better than this with just a regular disk attached. Now, I mentioned we put a battery-backed write cache in it. That helps. It does. It actually makes it a lot better. The same system, same hard drive. If I do all that, I'm looking at more like uh, a third of a second is what I measured on my system. So uh, what's interesting about that is that's saying uh, we're, we're roughly stuck behind about 32. 
uh, operations might be ahead of us in the queue. I don't know if they're directly related or not, but most hard drives are actually scheduling roughly uh, 31 operations at a time inside the disk itself. So I think, I think this, is, this is close to optimal. I mean, this is basically, if you have a hard drive and it has 32 random IOs queued up in it already, it will take about 300 milliseconds for those to queue. And you know, so this is very realistic. It matches what I expected here. You know, this is what real world disk behavior looks like. Last one, uh, here's that Intel SSD. Again, uh, several times faster, but it's, it doesn't make the problem go away. You know, on average, this Intel thing is, is cranking through most transactions in a fraction of a millisecond. You can't really see it on this graph, but I mean, almost all of these things are actually very low latency. But you know, there's a few of them that are in this, this chunky part at the bottom, and then just occasionally you'll, you'll see these little stutters pop up. And uh, it's, it's rare that I see them get much below 100 milliseconds. So even though people think of, of SSDIO as, as kind of free when it's random, it's really not when you're writing. When you're writing, there's, you know, it's got a clear cache block sound. It's got to do a lot of work under the hood. And the IO per second number that you get and what you'll actually achieve on a real system with the other latency in the stack and everything, uh, it looks like this for me a lot more often than it looks like you know, writes are free because random IO doesn't cost anything. Um, uh, I don't actually know. There are occasional heartbeats in this data at 10 milliseconds. There are occasional things that look like heartbeats that'll spike 100 milliseconds on some kernels. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to share this here at PGCon in particular is to try to make more people who are working with Postgres seriously aware of how I'm running these tests and what the idea is, because I'd like to get more people doing this to help me figure out like, why some of these weird things happen. So it may very well be the case that the real cause of this is not the storage. All of these latency measurements are, are real world from Postgres's perspective. And I'm not trying to point a finger at any component to being blamed here. You know, this is showing real world. This is the whole stack put together. This is the database side of that. We may very well be able to engineer some of these things out of Postgres or tune Linux to do better or try other operating systems. But I don't think anybody but me has been looking at the data like this. And this is a lot more interesting to look at this way than, than how I think most people were looking at it. Yeah, the write ahead log files are another thing I can try to separate out to see how those work in the whole thing. There's a lot of them. Um, this is kind of, I'm missing a graph. I'm confused now. There's one more graph that kind of pulled all this together. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm using all defaults except for the things that I, I mentioned. Oh, here we go. OK. So this is, this is the slide that's, for some reason, missing from the other version of that talk. Um, and this is, this is really my final topic here. Um, if you look at this stuff, you can think of it as kind of like a storage stack that's feeding through these multiple layers of caching. We've shared buffers at the top. It's writing to Linux's write cache. It's feeding into the battery-backed write cache. Um, the, thing that, the thing that is worth highlighting is if I try to make this thing smaller, people think that making that smaller will then make it drain faster. But the, the problem that I'm warning you about is if you make this smaller in hopes of getting it to drain faster, uh, this is what actually happens. What actually happens with a small write cache is the drain rate drops too. So we might have been getting only six megabytes per second out of it before, and it took a couple of seconds to drain. But the, the latency throughput trade-off here says, if you try to make latency low by making all the caches small, 
what actually happens is your throughput can drop so far that you'd have been better off with the bigger cache the whole time. And this is the really not obvious thing that I run into in the real world. It seems so obvious. Oh, caches take too long to clear, make the caches smaller. But it doesn't work out that way. And this, this phenomenon is, is the thing that's really hard to, really hard to um, nail down in that regard. Um, so sorry about the disorder on the slide a little bit. That would have flowed better if it would have been in the right spot. Um, it's basically the context. We're, we're at time. Well, wait a minute. Are, are, am I supposed to have 15 minutes for questions? Or? OK. Yeah, so we're, is, is the next one at 4.15? Oh, it is a four. Okay. So I'm. Okay. So uh, I guess I'll take questions for a couple of minutes here while we shuffle around but start getting off the projector. That's uh, the main topic I wanted to go over. So I hope you found that useful and slides are going on the website. Up there. Uh, could you repeat the first part of that? Well, what, what happens during a checkpoint is there's a single process, the checkpointer process. It scans all the memory in the system, finds everything that's dirty, writes it, and then it applies a little bit of logic to decide whether it should write more of it now or delay. And it's, it's, it's aiming to hit a schedule for how long it's supposed to take and spread it out over time. So that's, that's basically all that's happening. It's not concurrent. It's one process going through this. Well, no, this is, this is completely asynchronous with everything else happening in the system. The process itself is written, moved on, and gone. This is kind of clean up later. The, the reason that things get slower when the, check, when the checkpoints are happening is there, there are deadlines on things like what I.O. has to get done. And what will happen is uh, uh, you'll have like rights to the write ahead log and some other things that it does have to wait for. When you fill the queues up, things will get stuck waiting for them even though they are not that transaction. So once a queue fills, you can end up waiting for someone even though you don't normally care about them simply because the queue that's in the middle is, is full of stuff. It'd be different, but it doesn't actually change all that much because the write ahead log traffic is, uh, is not what's driving this. What's driving the performance is normally random I.O. to the database, not the sequential I.O. to the right ahead log. All right. I think I, yeah. My suggestion is uh, doing this kind of benchmarking, I find, yeah. to eliminate all the things, <coughs> sorry, oh, all other things, use like a random disk and run the exact same test. Yeah. And then you get to see if you have any variance, like of those hot spots without like the I.O. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, we can, we can try to isolate out which of these are like CPU-oriented things and which are disks. Uh, I, I suspect a lot of these are actually kernel-level things when, because we don't have anything in Postgres that runs at an interval like that. I mean, we have things that run in intervals, but not that match the heartbeat of what's showing up. Yeah. Okay, I think I'm done. I'll, I'll take more questions here. Thank you for your time, and I hope you found this useful.